The automobile industry is one of many that transcends national boundaries, uh, and it's only one example of why international competition can no longer be described as a contest between our producers and their producers. The same holds true throughout manufacturing. Uh, Dell is a well-known American brand, um, and uh, I'll, I'll throw in a European brand, Nokia as well, but m most, of the, most of the products that are uh, produced under these brands are not manufactured in the United States or Finland, uh, respectively. Some of the components are, uh, but, but most, of, most of the assembly and most of the components are, are, are produced elsewhere. Um, as, the, uh, as IBM's CEO uh, put it, he said, state borders define less and less the boundaries of corporate thinking or practice. And that fact carries uh, profound implications for the substance and conduct of national trade and economic policy. The, the distinction between what is American or Finnish or British uh, has been blurred. Uh, the definition has been blurred by foreign investment, cross-ownership, equity tie-ins, and these transnational supply chains. In the United States, and this is kind of funny, uh, foreign and domestic value added is so entangled in so many enterprises uh, that even the Buy American provisions uh, in, in the recently enacted American Recovery and Reinvestment Act struggle to define an American product without sort of conceding the inanity of the whole enterprise. The, the Buy American Act restricts the purchase of supplies that are not domestic end products. And this is how it's defined. For manufactured end products, the Buy American Act uses a two-part test to define a domestic end product. One, the article must be manufactured in the United States. And two, the cost of domestic components must exceed 50% of the cost of all components. So there's this recognition that we, that we are, that, that uh, an American product does contain a lot of value uh, added in, uh, in, in other countries, yet for some reason we feel this need to draw a distinction at 50% and, and to limit uh, purchases. Even the DNA of the steel industry, uh, which is among the most protectionist industries in the United States and, and in Europe and throughout world history, uh, the DNA of the U.S. steel industry is, is pretty tough to decipher nowadays. The largest U.S. steel company is a majority Indian-owned company, Mittel Arcelor, Arcelor Mittel. Uh, the largest German company, ThyssenKrupp, is building a $3.7 billion steel plant in Alabama. Uh, it's, gonna, it's going to create 2,700 permanent jobs. And here's another funny side effect of the Buy American provisions. Most, uh, most of the carbon steel that comes out of US, what are called US rolling mills, these are mills that, that don't make their own steel, but they process it. Uh, most of that steel does not qualify under the Buy American regulations. Uh, congressmen and senators in California are scratching their heads and saying, well, why do we support these Buy American provisions when none of our, <laughs> none of our rolling mills uh, has access to, to the U.S. procurement market now? So uh, it makes you think. Uh, whereas a generation ago, a product bearing a logo of an American company uh, would, would likely contain primarily and almost exclusively U.S. value added, uh, today it is much more likely to reflect foreign value added, and that's, that's important. Um, according to a WTO report, uh, in the last two decades, uh, the offshoring, of goods and offshoring of goods manufacturing and services has grown faster than trade in final goods. And that's one of the reasons I think we've heard these fairly dire predictions about what's going to happen with trade this year, something like a 9.9 percent decline. Uh, that's because there is a lot of uh, intermediate processing that's going on which is going to suffer. Uh, I have to, uh, economists at the Organization for Economic Cooperation, I know I shouldn't be citing them if I was just disparaging them at the outset, but th they have put together a database uh, about intermediate trade. And uh, it's, it's fairly robust. And what they have determined is that out of 31 countries for, for which data were available in the 90s and in the 2000s, uh, 29 demonstrated an increased reliance on, on imported uh, uh, intermediate inputs. In other words, interdependence is growing uh, th for most countries. Um, the top five countries uh, for offshoring, uh, as measured by uh, the, uh, the value of imported intermediate inputs over total, in, uh, in, total intermediate inputs, uh, Ireland is number one at 70%, then Hungary at 63%, Belgium, Slovak Republic, and Austria. So there is a lot of outsourcing, which, which you've all heard about, going on here in Europe. Uh, a 2008 Industry Week survey about the future of manufacturing found that 18% of U.S. Uh, manufacturers had outsourced and that by 2011 those manufacturers expected the proportion to rise to about 25%. So, it is, so it's increasing. Furthermore, in 2006, foreign majority-owned 
Um, companies employed over 5 million people in the United States and accounted for $195 billion in U.S. exports, $482 billion in imports. Uh, in 2008, U.S. foreign direct investment inflows reached record levels, $325 billion. That's up 37% from the previous year. Uh, and there are 875 new greenfield projects underway. So there is just a lot of intermingling of assets uh, around the world. The evolution from centralized production under one roof toward disaggregated production in different locations around the globe has been driven by revolutionary changes in transportation, the, you know, the, the advent of the container, uh, container shipping, uh, communications, uh, uh, other transportation technologies, and really seismic political changes as well. The opening of China to the West, uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, India's recognition that there was no alternative to, to capitalism and, and they, they needed to find an alternative to import substitution, and the, uh, the impact on other developing countries has really opened up uh, the world. I'm not going to go into all the details about why this has happened. It'll be in the paper, uh, but let's suffice it to say that the reduction in the time to transport uh, and the advent of containerized shipping uh, has uh, led consi to considerable reductions in, in costs and has enabled companies to actually realize a division of labor and, and, and take advantage of it in ways that were, were impossible before. Now, despite these revolutionary improvements in communication and transportation, the, the explosion in transnational production and foreign direct investment might have not occurred without the opening of China to the West and, and the fall of the Berlin Wall. And because, you know, we, we had these revolutionary changes in transportation and communication during the first wave of globalization, starting in around the 1870s. But the world was a much smaller place then. It was basically Western Europe and the United States and maybe Japan. Uh, but with all these new people coming online, without divisions between them, there was the, 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 the opportunity for economies of scale, uh, for specialization, for for tapping in to people who have particular skill sets to do particular functions, uh, increased considerably. Um, so without these political changes, I think the economic and technological developments uh, that led to the death of, de death of distance might not have been possible. Now, that's not to say we haven't had international fragmentation, uh, this kind of production going on over uh, for a longer period. Uh, IKEA. Uh, has been outsourcing to Poland since the 1970s. Uh, in the 1980s, Swiss Air uh, outsourced its functions, uh, uh, its accounting functions to India, as did the city of London. So uh, the last two decades, this trend has really, really picked up. 